drop it in there. You have to know how to write the, 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 um, um, you have to know how to, um, write the contracts and things like that. But, you know, so if you wanted to write an app, you'd have to learn how to write those too. Um, so Ethereum was really the first one to do that or first one to do it successfully. Um, and they've been very successful with that. Uh, Cardano is, um, and in parentheses is just their trading symbol, kind of like their stock symbol. Um, so Cardano is another smart contracts platform. This one is uh, still being developed. Um, it is uh, the, the leader of that, of that development team actually started with Ethereum uh, and broke off from that. Uh, Cardano is, is, seems to be very robust, um, very well designed, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they're going to be successful or not. Their, their technology is there, but I'm not sure if um, they're going to ever achieve that kind of like escape velocity. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that Ethereum is maybe kind of like Yahoo, like say back in the internet ages, like Ethereum is maybe like Yahoo, like they were really revolutionary at the time and Cardano might be more like Google, right? We'll see. I don't know. Um, we're kind of, once Google came on, they were doing it even better, you know, but, um, but I don't know the answer to that. If I have my, uh, I have my crystal ball though. Um, we talked about Ripple. Um, Ripple is um, like really for interbank transfers. Um, Dogecoin Folks may have heard about Dogecoin in the news. This has gotten crazy. Like Elon Musk was all about Dogecoin. This was created as an absolute joke, like an on-purpose joke uh, back when it was a parody of Bitcoin, um, Dogecoin. It was the Shiba Inu, the little dog, and uh, they they created it and they came out and said, "Oh, we're gonna um, uh, we're gonna make it." You know, I don't know, instead of 21 million coins, it was like a billion coins, and they're gonna you know they were tricked. So anyway, uh, the thing just can't die. It's unbelievable. Um, I I actually, funny enough story, back in 2014, I bought 7 million Dogecoin for $1,000. And earlier this summer, they went to 71 cents a piece. If I had sold it in 2014 <laughs> for, uh, for about $1,100, I would have um, I would have been talking to you from an island today. Um, so anyway, that kind of brush with greatness there. But um, there, it's, it's really interesting. I don't know quite what Elon's doing with this thing, but he, um, he, he certainly enjoys uh, playing with the Doge. Um, Polkadot is, um, a, another really interesting project. I have a small stake in it. Um, but Polkadot is, uh, uh essentially trying to make it so bit or blockchains can talk to each other. Like right now, Ethereum is a blockchain, Cardano is a blockchain, Ripple is a blockchain, Dogecoin is a blockchain. Polkadot is trying to make a blockchain that can go in between all of those and make inner blockchain communications work, right? So this is a side of, um, you know, like trading exchanges and things like that, but the ability to actually inner block, inner blockchain connectivity uh, is something that Polkadot's working on. Um, Uniswap is um, a uh, essentially a decentralized trading platform. So you can go to Uniswap and you can trade, um, uh, you know, for example, you could trade Matic for, um, uh, well, I don't have any other, you could trade Matic for Ethereum, right? Right on that, and you wouldn't need to use a um, a, a third-party exchange. You would never need to give up control of your coins. Um, now you can't do that with everything because, again, all the blockchains don't talk to each other yet. So Uniswap only works on uh, on things built on Ethereum, and I'll talk about that. Uh, Litecoin was uh, essentially an early clone of Bitcoin. It um, is has been touted as like digital silver, right? So Bitcoin digital gold, Litecoin digital silver. Um, it's interesting. It's still around. Um, it doesn't offer a whole lot um, other than it's a little bit faster and a little bit cheaper than Bitcoin. Um, cheaper to use and also cheaper to buy. Um, and then we've got Polygon Matic. This is a, a essentially like a scaling solution that sits on top of Ethereum and is, is meant to make things like Uniswap uh, cheaper and faster to use. So anyway, but again, there are over 10,000 of them, probably 9,000 of them are scams, <laughs> but, but uh, anything in the top 100 is, is generally pretty good. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, so we've got uh, stable coins out there as well. So we talked about Bitcoin, we talked about altcoins, and now we got stable coins. So stable coins are pegged to the US dollar. Um, they can be pegged to other currencies as well, but the dollar tends to be a world reserve currency and, and tends to be um, uh, tends to be used for the peg. Um, they're allowed they're they're used to allow for like ease of trading. So if you're if you're trading, uh, particularly for your high frequency trading, or day trading, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you might need to go in and out of dollars a couple of times a day or, or you know, much more than you would want to do with wire transfers or ACH transfers back and forth to your bank. So you can go into these stable coins. They're, you know, you kind of know what they're worth, that they're worth a dollar. Um, and it allows you to get in and out of trades without um, having to go actually into U.S. dollars. 
Um, they're really handy for that. Um, and some of them are maintained by like the PEG, so to speak, is maintained by a centralized entity like Tether is one. The Tether Corporation runs this and they, they make a certain amount of money off the carried interest on, on the, the, the dollars that are put into Tether. Um, and then there are others that are maintained by smart contracts. So there's DAI, like the Maker DAO um, is, is the group that, that created this, this um, peg called DAI, which runs on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and minting DAI is an interesting process, uh, well outside of the discussion of this, but essentially you can, you can buy one DAI, and one DAI is always equal to $1. Um, the one Tether dollar is always equal to $1. And there's a few other ones like that. So there's stable coins out there as well. Um, more inter more if you were going to go into this and try and do some day trading or something, which I, I don't recommend by any means, but um, there there are some some things like that. So just wanted to cover those kind of things. Um, talk about smart contracts a little bit. So I mentioned earlier, this is like a programmable programmable layer within some blockchains. Not every blockchain has this, but some do. Um, I mentioned Ethereum, Cardano, Neo is another one uh, that they haven't been terribly successful. Um, and emission is kind of like an app store for blockchain, right? So you can, if you want to do something, rather than go and build the whole thing yourself, you can just write the code and submit it to the blockchain in a smart contract, and then it'll, and then it'll, it'll act for you. Um, and there are things out there um, you can do. You can play game, you can do games out there. You can make contracts. You know, theoretically, you can make contracts that says like, hey, if somebody cuts my grass, I'll go ahead and give you, give you twenty dollars, right? You could do that kind of thing. You could also say um, um, that if if a um, uh, if certain event happened, then I would you could do create like an insurance contract or anything like that out there. Um, they've also got some prediction marketplaces, which are essentially ways to wager on the events that happen in the world, right? Like who's going to win the election, uh, who's going to win the football match, who's going to uh, what's the you know what's the high temperature going to be this year in uh, in Western Montana? You know, you can you can do that kind of thing out there, um, and they they. There are interesting ways that, you know, of course, the blockchain doesn't know what temperature it is in, in, in uh, you know, Billings, Montana, but it will, um, there are ways you can interact with that through so-called oracles and stuff like that. Um, digress a bit. So um, Ethereum is by far the most successful smart contracts platform. Um, they enable something called ERC-20 tokens, which is essentially the ability to add a, issue a token on top of Ethereum. Um, and these are kind of layer two tokens. But more importantly, there, there are a lot of program or projects running on top of Ethereum. So if you were to look at like the top 100 crypto assets by market capitalization, like the top 100 most valuable uh, crypto assets that are out there, 40 of those are actually running on top of Ethereum. So um, Ethereum essentially is a very successful platform for other projects to start up on. And that, it's that idea of building an app rather than building a whole blockchain. Um, and it's one of the reasons that it's been successful. Um, I do think that Cardano will, Cardano still hasn't launched their smart contract platform yet. I do think that they will. And, and my guess is that they're going to be fairly successful. Um, I don't have any Cardano. I do have Ethereum. I don't have any Cardano. Um, I, I am considering purchasing some in the future, but uh, I'm still kind of waiting to see if they, if they can achieve a, what I would consider like an escape velocity, right? Can they really get their project off the ground or not? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, they seem to be very intelligent, seem to have an extremely good team, um, but they're, they're also, um, I just don't know if the, if the, if the momentum is going to be there for them. So um, we'll talk a little bit about non-fungible tokens. Some, uh, some folks might have heard about these in the news. They kind of got some attention a couple of couple months ago when somebody sold a piece of artwork for $67 million on the blockchain. Um, so these are smart contract-based tokens. Um, just the terminology, non-fungible, uh, fungible assets, for those who aren't aware, fungible asset is essentially... Um, uh, like a dollar would be fungible, right? Any dollar is equivalent to any dollar. Um, a, a gallon of gasoline is fungible, right? Any gallon of gasoline is equivalent, uh, as long as it's the equivalent octane, right? And then it's not bad or anything like that. Like it's a good one gallon of gas is worth one gallon of gas. Um, it's not like when you go down to the gas pump, you want to pump like that specific gallon of gas out. You just want a gallon of gas. So the opposite of that, of course, though, is non-fungible. So a non-fungible token is something that is unique. And so even though they're tokens of the same type, they're distinctly identifiable, and you can't just trade one for the other. Um, you could think about this sort of like um, being tied to individual items, like a deed is to property, right? Like your house has a deed, um, and and therefore it is a specific description of something in the physical world. Um, of course, you can do this not just the physical world, but you can do it in the, in, in the virtual world as well. Um, the thing with these NFTs is they can be created at massive scale and yet still be individually identifiable. Um, 
And so examples of this would be, some would be like ownership of works of art, um, right? Like a Banksy could sell uh, the ownership rights of one of his paintings to, to somebody at Sotheby's or whatever it is, and they could own it without ever having to meet him, without him ever having to expose who he is publicly, um, could do something like that. Or we did see one uh, a couple of months ago where a guy sold a, um, uh, a, a digital image for <laughs> ownership of a digital image for $67 million at auction. Um, that shocks even, even me. Um, but uh, very interesting. Um, we're seeing some some branching in like ownership of specific items in online games, right? So you can have like a in World of Warcraft, you could have a particular sword, and you could actually own like that sword, not just have it, but like own it, and you could pull it off of off of World of Warcraft and, and hold it offline and send it to a different game, maybe allow this kind of internet. You could sell it to somebody else. You could uh, do all sorts of things. Um, we're seeing stuff with loyalty clubs and perks. A couple of the Formula One teams are partnering with with uh, one of the blockchains, Tezos, to to uh, do loyalty clubs. Um, we're seeing cases where fans could be issued like specific tokens for having been at a race, or they could they could um, use those tokens then to, to vote on, um, you know, maybe what uh, what color the jerseys are going to be next year or something like that. Um, and then the other one that I think is going to be very interesting is things like concert tickets. Um, so you could see a case where like concert tickets, like scalping of concert tickets is a huge problem right now. If, if a concert promoter wants to sell a ticket for fifty dollars, they're all going to be bought up, and they're going to be resold for one hundred and fifty dollars, or three hundred dollars, or whatever it is. Um, and you can see a case where issuing concert tickets as NFTs on the blockchain would allow you to actually have control over what happens to those tickets after you sell them. Um, and you could have a case where I just, and I'm just making this up, but you could have a case where, for example, every time a ticket is exchanged, the concert promoter gets, you know, forty percent of that price. So even the scalper, as they're scalping the ticket, still has to pay the concert promoter. I mean, it doesn't really help the public who's overpaying overpriced tickets for concerts, but I'm just saying, like, you get this level of control that's very interesting that you could even see in a piece of art, you could see a case where you, you issue that art ownership on the as an NFT, and every time that painting is sold, the artist gets a percentage of it. Um, whereas that's just something not, not really possible today outside of contract law and having to put you know take somebody to court or something like that. So I would say, bottom line, I don't know where this is going, but it's going to be big. Um, and, if, and I don't know where to invest in it yet, but it's going to be big. And when I find out, I, I certainly will be. But um, watch this space. The non-fungible tokens are going to be um, a fascinating uh, uh, next step in, in, in what the blockchain does. Um, and then we've got uh, DeFi. So this has gotten some news as well lately, decentralized finance. Um, this is essentially, again, smart contracts, again, built on the Ethereum blockchain for the most part. Um, and these are enabling financial markets in the blockchain, right? So we're creating like blockchain-based trading platforms like Uniswap. Um, there's staking and validating, which are um, a little bit beyond the scope of what we can talk about here, but they're ways to essentially earn interest on your crypto. So you could you could own you know five Ethereum tokens, and you could you could essentially loan them out to other people who want to trade with them, and they would they pay you interest. And I'm telling you, the interest you're getting out there is like five to ten percent, sometimes fifteen percent. Um, you know, compare that to a savings account or compare that even to like a money market. You'd be, you'd be lucky to get 1% today in the traditional markets. And we're seeing 10, 15, 20% sometimes um, on the interest earned on crypto. Um, not to mention you still own the crypto. So you're still, it's still appreciating it, whatever the value, whatever the level of crypto does. Um, we're seeing the establishment of a yield curve native on the blockchain, which is fascinating, right? So like you would see, you see a case where like in the bond market, if you, if you're buying a five-year bond, you might expect, you know, a certain percentage, but if you're buying a 10-year bond, you're going to expect a higher percentage. Um, it is a, um, a fascinating thing. We're seeing this, this all unfold. So um, I would say that um, you know, this is done again without any centralized party or centralized or trusted entity. It's all done in the blockchain. Um, so you know, less susceptible to manipulation and things like that. Um, it's set up via smart contracts, again, mostly on Ethereum. I will say this is one area where I would expect significant regulatory pressure to come to, come to bear. Uh, folks like the SEC are not gonna enjoy um, having uh, essentially a, a shadow banking economy or shadow banking um, set up off to the side. So this is an area I would look for um, for increased pressures, but I will say that the um, enforcement of it's going to be very difficult because there's there's no, these don't live in a country. They don't live in any jurisdiction. It's very unclear who has the rights to, well, you wouldn't even know who to sue or who to put in jail for the most part, but um, very, very difficult to enforce. But again, watch this fits. Um, let me talk briefly here about developers. Um, so we talk about developers and programmers that are out in the ecosystem. Um, one thing I would say is that um, the, 
if we want to look at like where people are spending their time, um, just briefly out here, we've kind of got a lot of developers down here. This this line is a it's a comparison of 2019 to 2020. Um, this line here is essentially that they didn't grow or lose, you know, didn't gain or lose developers. Um, you see a lot of these companies down here, poke it out, you can make out. Uh, what I do want to point out though is Ethereum is up here. They're off the charts um, in terms of the number of developers that are working on the Ethereum blockchain versus all the other blockchains combined. So uh, very interesting. And I, I just like to, to understand, you know, where people are spending their time and, and efforts. So I will take a breath here. We can move on to the investing piece. Um, talk a little bit about the risk profile. Um, I think investing in crypto is extremely high risk. Um, it's also the best performing asset class of the last decade, right? Um, if you compare it to the S&P 500, it blows away like by orders of magnitude. Um, I would say if you're interested in this asset, never risk more than you can afford to lose. I would definitely consider it speculation and not investing, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's uh, certainly very risky. Um, and don't put the college fund in it, right? Whatever you do, please uh, don't, you know, don't, don't jeopardize future plans over this type of thing. Um, if you're interested in day trading, um, really kind of a one <laughs> one message for you, I wouldn't do it. Um, and and if you if you do anything close to it, I would never use margin. Uh, for folks not not familiar with margin, essentially um, um, margin is the ability to multiply your bet, right? Uh, so you you might do a two x margin or a five x margin, but that means things happen two times as fast or five times as fast. And and sure, that's good when it's going up, but it's really bad when it's going down. Um, and when you're using margin, you can you can actually be liquidated, right? So if, if it goes down past the point of your collateral, <clears throat> they'll sell your position low and, and zero your account out, and um, you'll have lost everything. So I would be very careful with margin. Um, it's very common to see like something called stop loss something be done, which is um, the uh, the ability of, like uh, algorithmic trading bonds to drive the price down past stop losses and then and then essentially buy back lower. Um, pretty rough environment out there. So, um, and there's also a concept of arbitrage, like you might see on one exchange, a, a Bitcoin's, you know, 31,000 on the other exchange, Bitcoin's 33,000. You say, oh, I'll buy it low and I'll sell it high, but it's always too good to be true. Um, so in terms of buying and selling, um, Bitcoin is king. And this is something I, I have to really, but um, Bitcoin is, is the, predominant asset in the class. If Bitcoin's going up, pretty much everything's going up. And if Bitcoin's going down, pretty much everything's going down. Um, so when you want to look at what's happening in crypto, it's very important to understand what's happening in relative to Bitcoin. Um, and it just can't be overstated. Um, in terms of where to buy it and sell it, you can use Coinbase.com or Gemini.com. Those are uh, domestic U.S. exchanges. They're well-regulated. They're under New York City banking laws. Um, and they're, they're both, I, I use both of them. They're both highly reputable. Um, they work very much like E-Trade or like Fidelity, where you sign up for an account, you have to do identity verification and things like that. But that's the that's the safest way to start this out. Um, I would say just be cautious. High volatility, massive swings are you know 70% corrections are pretty much the routine. We're in the middle of a 50 to 60% correction right now in Bitcoin, um, down from the high. You know, it was $65,000 about three uh, two months ago. Uh, it's at 32,000 now. So. Um, and I would say just the bottom line is buy when you're ready to buy and sell when you're ready to sell. Um, I've, I've, I've tried scalping the market. I've tried saying, oh, I'm going to sell now and buy back tomorrow and it's going to be lower and I, I just lose every time. So um, my rule now is I set some targets and when I hit those targets, I have to sell. Or when I when I want to buy, I, I set some targets. When I hit those targets, I have to buy. So um, I would say if you're interested in trying to trade during peak market activity, you may be disappointed because a lot of these platforms tend to crash. When everything is going in, everybody's trying to rush in and 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 um, uh, get to the get to the sell button or get to the buy button, and a lot of these platforms tend to have have activity. So it's better to it's better to just be out be kind of a little bit above the fray and, and make your make your calls and, and you know get in and stay in for the long haul. Um, I would say both of these Gemini and, and Coinbase have a retail interface, which looks a little bit more like Robinhood, a little bit more like um, um, PayPal. Uh, you're going to pay a little higher fees if you use those. So I would look for the trader interfaces. The fees tend to be only uh, they tend to be about 30% of what the retail interface trade uh, retail interface fees are. A um, couple of notes: you do have the ability to um, buy fractions of the coin. You can go down to like eight decimal points. So you can go um, you can just you know buy five dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, it'll work. Um, and then uh, I would avoid, as I mentioned earlier, kind of these forks like the Bitcoin Cash, Gold, Ethereum Classic. Um, and then there is a question of like, should you leave your funds on the exchange, right? This is, I think this is a, a, a pretty uh, interesting question. 
if you leave your funds on the exchange, you're trusting a third party to store that. Like you're trusting it like you trust your bank. You're trusting it like you trust Fidelity. Um, these are certainly reputable companies, but they could go out of business. They could be seized by the government. They could uh, be hacked by hackers, right? And so if you're leaving your funds on the exchange, you're susceptible to their fate, right? Uh, you're putting your hands in their fate. So um, I would say as a general rule of thumb, what I've been told and I think is reasonable is like probably you know, look at it in terms of your own net worth and things like that. But if you have like, generally speaking, like probably leaving like $10,000 on the exchange is probably fine, right? Like it's not, hopefully not the end of the world. Hopefully this is all, all Vegas money anyway. And, you know, you, you put a hundred bucks in and later on it's 10,000 or whatever it is. And yay. But you get over that, like between 10,000, a hundred thousand, really start looking at pulling those off to a hard wallet, uh, something like a ledger or a treasure. Um, and, and I've got that in a little later slide, but um, and anything over $100,000, no question. Get it off the exchange, keep it safe, uh, but do your research on how to do that ahead of time um, and make sure that you can you can do that safely. The last thing you wanna do is outsmart yourself. Um, I, I heard a story a while back of a guy who in the last bull run, he, he finally had enough to pay off his house and retire. And when he went to move the funds, he had them all offline, did everything right. He had lost his password to his vault and he can't get access to his funds. So be very careful. Don't outsmart yourself. Um, but you know, you have to you have to walk a balance between safety and security and, and not um, not losing your, your own stuff. There's no help desk to call on that if you lose your private wallet. So um, all right. See, we're doing a little late on time. We'll see what we can do here. So taxes, um, yes, you have to pay taxes. Um, I hate to say it, but you do. Uh, it's just like stocks. So you, you don't have to pay anything when you buy it, but you do have to pay when you sell it. Um, it's taxed as a property by the IRS. Um, IRS publication uh, 2014 clarified that. Um, in addition, crypto to crypto sales are taxed in US dollars at the time of the sale. Um, so if you were to say, buy Ethereum, and then later on you wanted to sell that and you sold it directly to Bitcoin, but you didn't go through dollars. It's still a taxable event and it's still taxed in the dollar value at the time of the sale. Um, so just something very important to, to keep in mind, like all these sales have taxable events associated with them. Um, most major exchanges, crypto and, uh, or sorry, Coinbase and Gemini will send you a 1099 um, that they're also gonna send it to the IRS. So uh, helps helps uh, keep honest people honest there. Um, the, they work the same way in terms of capital gains. So short-term capital gains, anything uh, owned for less than a year is taxed as common income. Um, if you own it for more than a year, um, it's taxed as long-term capital gains, uh, which is a, generally speaking, a, a lower tax rate. Um, so the rules on that are if you have adjusted gross income of less than $400,000 a year, then you'll only pay 15% federal tax on a long-term capital gain. Um, if you're over 400,000, um, you'll pay 20% on federal tax, federal capital, or federal tax, um, which is you know way better than the 35 or, or 39%. Um, I will say that the uh, the Biden tax plan that I um, the information I saw looked at increasing the long-term capital gains tax on gain on adjusted gross income over a million dollars up to 39%. So uh, there is definitely something to watch out for there. Uh, <laughs> Should you be so fortunate to have over a million dollars of income to worry about? Um, also, you can realize capital losses with this, right? So if you um, if you sold something at a loss, you know you, you bought Bitcoin at thirty, you bought Bitcoin at sixty five thousand, and you sold it at thirty two thousand, you know you would have a capital loss. Um, let's just say that capital loss was was thirty thousand um, dollars. You can use capital losses to offset capital gains, uh, so that's good. But if you have capital losses in excess of your capital gains, just bear in mind, there's a $3,000 per year cap um, on deducting capital losses from your common general income. Uh, so you would be able to, you know, let's just say you had uh, uh, you had a $30,000 loss, but you also had $15,000 in gains. You could offset that completely. Then you have a $15,000 loss still, and you can't just write that whole thing off. You can only write $3,000 per year off of that. You can carry it over the next year and the next year and the next year, the $3,000 each year. But um, anyway, the capital losses are just a, a little thing uh, to be aware of. However, good news, taxes, the one way this is different from um, um, taxation of a uh, stock is that wash sales are permitted. I don't know if folks are familiar with wash sales, but wash sales is essentially selling a, uh, a stock at a loss and then buying it back immediately just as a way of, of um, realizing that loss for tax purposes. 
So uh, wash sales are actually permitted, which is kind of interesting. Again, though, I just got to call your attention. I am not a tax advisor. Uh, please, please consult your own tax advisor for um, more official stuff. But you can tell them I said the wash sales are permitted. But <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see what he or she says. Um, 1031 like kind exchanges um, had been thought to apply to crypto to crypto sales. However, uh, the, the um, the Trump Tax Cut and Jobs Act, I think it was called, was uh, clarified that 1031 like kind exchanges only apply to real estate and no other uh, securities or properties. Uh, it's very important to keep records. Again, your cost basis is always in U.S. dollars, um, although I recommend keeping track of your cost basis in um, both U dollars as well as the currency you bought and sold from, as well as in Bitcoin. Um, I, I can tell you I have had a case where like I had a, a like an altcoin, I thought it was doing really well, right? And it was, it was up, I don't know, 10% on the year or 20% on the year. And then I looked at what it would have been if I had just kept it in Bitcoin. And it would have been up like 300%. So I was, I had, yes, I had made money, but I hadn't made money the same way I would have if I hadn't tried to quote unquote diversify. So always keep track of your cost basis in dollars, but keep an eye on what it is in, in Bitcoin as well. Um, one thing I will say, I'd be happy to answer any questions I can on this, is that there are ways of doing so, uh, self-directed IRAs and solo 401ks in crypto. Um, I have worked with a very good company um, uh, called IRA Financial. Uh, Adam Bergman is their CEO. Uh, I've spoken to him a number of times. He's been exceptionally helpful. I don't have any affiliation with them other than I do have a couple of accounts with them. Um, but IRA Financial is a fantastic um, uh, resource if anybody's interested in doing self-directed IRA or solo 401k. Um, with that, you can do traditional or Roth um, to, to do any of that stuff. You can, do, you can roll over to it, anything you need. Yeah. Um, all right, regulation will blast through. I think we're getting to the end of the good stuff here. So um, IRS says that, that uh, um, crypto is taxed as a property. The Security and Exchange Commission says it's regulated as a security. I put to the extent of their powers just because it is this kind of transnational thing. Um, USA tends to be neutral or supportive of crypto, um, tends not to be very opposed to it, at least as of yet. Um, China, on the other hand, is banning it as we speak. Um, they're doing their best to stamp it out. I, I don't know if they'll be successful, but they might be, at least in China. They, they can't stop the network, but they can stop their people from using it. Right? So by blocking all the bank, bank on-ramps, off-ramps, by making mining difficult or illegal. Um, and uh, so I mentioned earlier, you know, the blockchain is not a company. There's no CEO. It really it's a really interesting thing to see how the regulators might try to approach this problem. Um, uh, it doesn't really exist in any locality. It's, it's simply a native protocol of the internet. Uh, it's running all over the world. So, you know, who do you take to jail? Who do you sue? Uh, how do you shut somebody down? Um, really the, the only way they have right now is to essentially make it difficult to interact with it in the, from the traditional financial system, right? You know, it's one thing to have Bitcoin. It's another thing to not be able to, um, not be able to, um, sell it back to dollars, right? And then where do you do, right? You got this thing that's out there. So maybe you could trade it for a Corvette or something like that. Um, and then anyone can create a blockchain, right? So this kind of goes back to the to the permissionlessness aspect of it. Um, all right, so major pricing factors. Um, I think we've got uh, kind of this reduced inflation rate. Um, uh, we'll talk about the stock to flow model here in a second. We've got kind of this four-year cycle we'll talk about it and, and uh, some improvements to the Ethereum protocol that are going to kind of reduce the inflation rates of this, um, of the, I should say, the inflation rates of the coins, right? So the issuance rate of the coins. On the other hand, so that's going to drive price down. Right. Lowering the inflation rate will drive price up. However, on the other hand, we've got inflation pressures coming from the traditional economy, right? We've got Fed money printing with all the COVID relief. We've got modern, modern monetary theory other things like that, kind of this Fed printer goes burr type of thing, um, which seems to be related to some of the later spikes in, in price, right? As, as folks are expecting inflation, folks are expecting uh, traditional assets to, to, while their price may increase, their value may decrease. Um, there's some speculation by retail investors, Robinhood, a bunch of people, their stimulus cash and stuff like that. Um, we also have a lot of speculation by hedge funds out there, and, and Bitcoin is an unre unregulated market, and let me tell you, these hedge funds can throw around a lot of money and they can move the price. Um, it's a relatively low um, uh, low liquidity out there, so um, they're they're doing their thing. Um, but here we have a new asset class. It's not tied to a nation state. It's not tied to a fiat currency, um, and it exists independent of traditional financial markets. Um, although, as more and more players in the financial market get more and more exposure to it, it gets more and more correlated and, and, and can kind of be dragged down. But it is technically disconnected. Um, talk briefly here, maybe another five minutes, then we'll take some questions. Um, 
this is coin market cap this is a great site to go just take a look at what's out there um you'll see here this is um uh, this is tracking almost 11,000 different cryptos on 385 exchanges around the world um as of this afternoon when i took the screen capture it was uh total market cap is about 1.3 trillion dollars 67 billion dollars changed hands uh in the last 24 hours uh bitcoin accounts for 45 percent of that and ethereum accounts for uh 17 percent of that um and then you can see bitcoin and ethereum you can see some information you know price their their 24-hour activity market cap and kind of a, a little bit of a squiggly line in terms of what they've been doing lately um, and we talked about a few of these right so bitcoin ethereum tether is that uh, us dollar coin i didn't talk about finance coin here cardano i talked about that xrp is that ripple one i talked about um, and here's another stable coin this is us dollar coin issued by coinbase um, and um, so just a, a good site so coinmarketcap.com um, if we look at the current market conditions this is a graph of the last uh, five or five and a half years of bitcoin uh see so starting in 2015 here going through the bull run in 2017 dropping down through the lows following COVID. Uh, this is that kind of February 2020 crash of the stock market and everything else. And then, you know, rocket ship since then. Of course, we've retraced 50% uh, since then. What I don't care for about this chart is that it, it really is, the, it's a traditional chart, it flattens things out. So I, I like to look at things in logarithmic mode. This is the same chart over the same time. Uh, but in this case, you see, like, uh, go back a slide, like here, these are very predictable, like 8,000, 12,000, 16, 20, 24. If you look at the logarithmic mode, it, it goes, you know, 20 to 280 in one bar, and then up here it's like 7,200 to 10,000, and then, you know, 72,000 to 10,000. So it allows you to get a lot more fidelity on the, the older stuff. So here we see the, the 2015 to 2017 run up, kind of that peak out at $20,000, uh, drop down through consolidation period, then the, the, the real crash with COVID, and then the spike up since then, and then our retracement. So um, that's kind of what we've done. Um, and I'll talk through maybe two of the models that I see uh, being helpful in terms of understanding what might happen in the future. Um, this is uh, not me. This is a guy named Ben Cohen on YouTube. I took a screenshot from his, his channel um, and credit him here. So these are the, the four market cycles that we have for Bitcoin and kind of in yellow. Or, so in, in blue, we've got our 2011 where Bitcoin went from about one penny, if you can believe that's where it started, right? About one penny to about $20. And that took about 250 days to do that. Okay. Um, then we have 2013 went from two dollars, and this is the this is basically the zero zero point is at the low, right? Where that low was. 2013 it went from two dollars to about eleven eleven hundred dollars, and that took about seven hundred days. Yep. All right, so about twice as long, and and not quite as high a, a change, right? If you look at this, um, the 2017 one went from about two hundred dollars up to about twenty thousand dollars, right? Uh, that took eleven hundred days, right? So we have two hundred fifty days, seven hundred days, eleven hundred days. And, and it didn't go as high, right, before it started dropping down. Um, and now in the purple here, we've gone from 35,000, or 3,500, I should say, to 65,000. Um, and you can see here, we've dropped back down, of course. Now, the question, and what, what Ben posits, is that he talks about this thing called lengthening cycles theory. And he says, okay, so we, we kind of drop down like this, and then we drop down like this, and it gets longer each time. So he, he says, okay, it would make sense if the, the, you know, we, we consolidate here a little bit, maybe, and then we go back up and we touch something out here, right? Maybe, you know, 1,300 days or 1,400 days or something like that before we drop down. So, you know, he, he says, and I, I tend to agree, that, that this could look kind of something like this, right? Where it goes up for a bit, it drops back down, right? And then goes back up, but but not to the same relative heights, right? So I think if you, and I recommend Ben's channel, I've got him in kind of the additional information, um, but Ben, I think he's very plugged in. He's a quantitative analysis, uh, focuses on crypto, um, and very smart guy. Um, you know, he's looking for Bitcoin to hit somewhere between hundred thousand and two hundred thousand dollars sometime in twenty 2020 twenty or twenty thirteen, um, which is you know certainly would be nice for everybody who's got to. So, um, the other model that I think is interesting is something called stock to flow, and this works on uh, trying to understand the available um, stock which is the Bitcoin that's already been mined and the flow, which is the new Bitcoin that is being mined. Um, and this, this attempts to work in this, this price or the block reward having or cutting in half that I talked about before. And you can see this, this, this model was developed back out here in early 2017. And it, it seems to have successfully, like the, the blue line is, is the model prediction. Um, and it seems to have successfully tracked pretty well, right? We, we came up, we went above it, dropped back down below it and then normalized and now went up. And now we'll see what happens. We'll see if this model continues to go out or not. But the stock to flow model is something certainly worth looking into. 
for uh, understanding those components um, and how a decreasing supply of Bitcoin leads to an increased price of Bitcoin, right? So supply and demand, right? Um, that as supply decreases, the miners have less of it to sell, less of it into the marketplace, that for the price goes up um, as, as inflation goes down, essentially. Um, so talk briefly about some resources. I wanna just cover security best practices. I can't stress this enough. Um, basics, uh, don't reuse your passwords. Um, it's a huge security hole. If you're reusing passwords, that's fine to do in your day to, in your you know in your daytime. But uh, when you're when you're working with crypto, please use a new password, and it's okay to write it down on paper. I would never recommend storing it on your computer, but it's totally okay to write it on paper. I know a lot of people even just have like a like an address book, and they write down their their um, you know it's a C for Coinbase. They put it under the letter C. They write down the the password in there. Um, the idea that like somebody's going to break into your house and steal your your passwords and know what to do with them is, is pretty low risk compared to somebody being able to hack your computer and pull those out. And, and even that pales in comparison to the risk of using your password in more than one site. So please don't reuse passwords. Um, I really do recommend using two-factor authentication. This is, um, you know, it could be they email you a code, they text you a code, they, you have a, a Google, Google um, my, my one of choice is Google Authenticator. Uh, which is a really good program, um, and, but using two-factor authentication is just extremely important. There's, there are so many hacks and risk factors out here for this. Um, I do recommend using the Chrome browser instead of any others, um, instead of uh, particularly not Internet Explorer. Uh, Firefox is probably all right, but the Chrome browser is, is the most popular with the with the with the crypto community. Um, they have the most extensions and things like that. Um, so both for security and functionality. Um, and then I would recommend just in general installing an ad blocker. Uh, the one that I use is uBlock Origin, which I have to stress is not uBlock. Um, they are they sound a lot the same, but uBlock Origin it'll block all sorts of ads. And a lot of the ways that malware and viruses and things like that get through is is by corrupting the uh, the ads that come in on pages. So um, if you use an ad blocker, not only will your browsing experience be happier, but you're less likely to get a, any kind of viruses or any kind of malware. Um, if you want to get more advanced, I do recommend looking into password managers, um, LastPass, 1Password, some of these other things uh, are certainly good. Be careful about your secret questions. Um, just in general, folks, I see it on Facebook all the time, you know, like, like uh, the, you know, your porn star name is, is um, you know, your, your dog's name by the and the last name is like the street you grew up on. Well, what are security questions? Their security questions are, your, what's your dog's name? What street did you grow up on? What car was your, what was your first car? Right, where did you have your honeymoon? these are the things that, that Facebook is asking you to post all the time. And the people that put those, those little fun quizzes out there, they're pulling all that data in. I promise you, they're mining that data from you and they're compiling that. And then they're selling it to hackers and they're making money. So be very careful about your secret questions. Um, in fact, on sites that are high security for me, I don't even answer the secret questions with an actual answer. I use my password manager to generate like a six to eight character gibberish. And then I store that in my password manager so that my, even if I did tell somebody that my first truck was an F-150, right? It doesn't matter. I've never used that as a security question. So just a, just a word, of, word of caution there. Um, if you're getting into high dollar values, I would avoid using text messaging for two-factor authentication. Um, the two-factor authentication can be hacked that way. You can, you can have a, what's called a SIM takeover attack. Um, and you can also call your mobile phone provider and ask to place a pin on your account, which helps um, helps protect you. But uh, text messaging two-factor authentication is a weak point in the system. Uh, you can get it hardware wallets. I use a ledger. Um, I've not used Trezor, Trezor, but they have a good reputation. Uh, hardware wallet is like a um, like a USB thumb drive that'll manage your crypto for you. Um, you can use uh, offline wallets, cold storage. Uh, these are actually just printed out on a piece of paper and you use them um, that way. They no no hacking on a piece of paper, right? Um, and I mentioned earlier, like, don't outsmart yourself. There's a there was a guy that I you know did read about online that essentially had it all and lost it all because he he, he lost his password. So uh, there's a lot to it there. Um, let's see. We talked about uh, major U.S. exchanges. Uh, Coinbase.com has a retail friendly side. Pro.coinbase.com is that uh, advanced user interface with lower fees. Uh, Gemini has a retailer thing, but if you if you go in the settings, you can go to Active Trader and you get lower fees. Uh, we're talking about fees reducing from 1.5% to 0.5%. So it's a significant change. It's a 30, you know, a 66% a reduction in fees. Um, PayPal and Robinhood are both offering crypto. Um, I've got uh, asterisk next to them because there's a there's a moniker out there. If it's not your keys, it's not your crypto. Um, the thing with PayPal and Robinhood is you cannot withdraw your crypto from them. 
it's essentially like using a fidelity or something like that like for stocks right you can't you can't really take your stock out of fidelity i mean i guess you can you, you can you can transfer to another bro, another uh, broker but um with Robinhood and paypal if, if, if like tomorrow Robinhood announced that they were just going to stop supporting crypto your only choice would be to sell it incur the taxable event withdraw it to your bank account and then send it to another exchange like coinbase and actually buy it again you can't take the crypto out of those things so paypal and Robinhood are very easy to use um uh, I, I don't, you know, I certainly don't have any, any um, hard feelings towards anybody that uses them. I would just say like, if you're starting out, um, it takes a little bit extra work to get set up with Coinbase um, or Gemini. But um, if you do that now, you'll be happier in the future. Um, uh, in terms of real-time market info, you can go to tradingview.com. That's where I took some of those screenshots from before. Uh, CryptoWatch.ch uh, there um, is another one, a little easier to use, but a little less powerful. Uh, Coin market cap we talked about. Um, this stats that by Bitcoin sounds kind of scammy, right? But this is actually where that stock to flow model is hosted. Um, and their, their site is fine. Um, and glassnode.com does a lot of work in terms of analytics about the database or about the uh, blockchain. Um, and generally, just consider using those logarithmic views. Um, it'll usually be called log view or logarithmic view um, for looking at long term trends um, in, uh, in there. You'll see a lot more fidelity over time. Um, uh, really run a real long time here, so we've got some blockchain explorers. Uh, we'll include these in the notes. So blockchain.info will let you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, etherscan.io for Ethereum, Polkadot, uh, polkascan.io for Polkadot, um, and there are many others. Um, in terms of info, uh, Ben Cohen, I referenced earlier, absolutely spot on guy on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, he has a paid subscription. I haven't, I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. It's hundred dollars a month. Uh, it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to buy that. Um, but uh, you know, who knows what kind of money it could make yet? He seems very plugged in. Um, and I'm, I'm really considering pulling the trigger on that. Um, Real Vision is another one on YouTube. I've, uh, they are not focused exclusively on crypto, but they're focused on macroeconomics as a whole. And they have, a, uh, I would say, about 25% of their content is based on crypto. Uh, if you want to learn about the bond market, you want to learn about uh, macroeconomic trends, uh, things influencing crypto and in crypto itself, um, Real Vision on YouTube is absolutely fantastic. They do a daily briefing every day, kind of talk about what happened in the market and stuff like that. So uh, really good stuff. Uh, Ivan on tech on Twitter, uh, or I saw YouTube and Twitter. Um, he's kind of a bro, kind of, you know, whatever, but, but he's, he's pretty plugged in. He knows what he's talking about. Um, uh, he's not my first source, but I do kind of, I'll put him on and see what, what, what things are happening occasionally. Uh, Reddit's uh, cryptocurrency subreddit. Um, just warning there, everybody has an agenda. Uh, Bitcointalk.org has forums, but watch out for scams. Um, and a lot of things on Twitter and crypto are scams. So just be careful. Um, it's, it's not a bad place, but it's not, uh, it's not a great place. So, um, if you want to YouTube some stuff, I would look for anything uh, featuring Vitalik Buterin. He's the Ethereum founder. Uh, look for anything with Charles Hoskins. He's the Cardano founder. Uh, Michael Saylor uh, is the CEO of MicroStrategy. He recently invested $1.5 billion of his company's treasury in Bitcoin. Um, he is uh, by far like the most permeable I've ever, I've ever encountered. It's unbelievable. Um, and then uh, Rao Paul, uh, the CEO of Real Vision, uh, also very informative. So, all right. Um, in terms of next steps, um, Consider your risk tolerance, uh, do some research on coins, communities, developer focus, uh, open an account with Coinbase, uh, you know, with TD or Fidelity. Um, if you plan, you know, plan to buy and hold, keep good records, pay taxes when you sell. Um, for altcoins, you know, track your gains and losses against Bitcoin and Ether and Ethereum, uh, not just against dollars. Um, and then always consider the fully diluted market cap here. So this is, um, you know, a coin might be 30 cents, but there might be 10 billion of them, right? Versus another coin that might be $500, but there might only be, 100 million of them or something, something like that. So um, it, the kind of market capitalization, cheap is not as cheap. Um, in terms of a sample portfolio, um, I would start anybody I talk to with 50% Bitcoin, 50% 50, 50 Ethereum, just half and half. Just go in, you know, if you, you've got $500 to put in, put 250 in one, 250 in the other. Um, and then you're, you're in a pretty good spot. Um, if Bitcoin goes up, Ethereum's going to go up. And if Bitcoin goes down, Ethereum's going to go down. But what I will say is, I personally think that Ethereum is going to outperform Bitcoin over the next three to five years. Um, personally, we'll see. But but I but I'm 50-50 on that, right? <laughs> so uh, so hard to know. Um, some other ones that I would work I would look at first. Um, certainly worth looking at others too. But it would be Cardano, Polkadot, Uniswap, and Chainlink. Um, Chainlink I haven't talked about yet. This is a, an oracle that helps to interface with kind of the real world. Um, but uh, certainly worth looking at. Um, and then just last thing, uh, not all. Exchanges offer all the coins. Uh, I think everything here is, is available on, I'm sure it's on Coinbase. I think almost all of these are on um, uh, Gemini. Polkadot might not be yet. So, 
All right. I know I had a blast through a lot of stuff there, but let me uh, say we're at the Q&A, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Well, Dave, first I want to thank you for such a wonderful introduction to a very complex subject. Um, and thanks for also uh, uh, posting uh, some of the uh, places where our guests can go for more information. Uh, pursuant to that, I want to remind our guests that uh, if you'd like, you can come and visit me at the Public Library, at Livonia Public Library. You can ask for me, Ken Bignati. And um, there, uh, we actually have access to a lot of resources that will help you uh, dig in uh, deeper to uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Uh, so uh, come and visit us and we should be able to set you up. Um, I also want to remind our guests that uh, the recording of this session will be made available on our library's YouTube channel, which is available uh, to view. You can actually link to it right from our website. So once you visit our website, just click on the first uh, YouTube um, icon that you see, and that'll take you right to our channel. So we do have, uh, I've got uh, three questions here, Dave, all from our uh, guest, Nicole. And uh, her first question, uh, she follows up with ha ha, but this is, uh, this is actually kind of a, a serious question and uh, potentially interesting, simple. How do I become a miner? I, I, I think that there's probably, uh, you need to talk about some of the hardware that's involved with this and some of the costs of that. Sure, sure. So there, there are two primary ways to become to become a miner. Um, one is to do what's called solo mining, which is you're you're buying all the hardware, you're building um, the hardware up. Like so, picture um, picture a you, you build your own case. And I, like I, when I did this a couple of years ago, it was building a case out of like aluminum rails and buying a motherboard and a CPU and a bunch of graphics cards and power supplies and building those, putting those together. Um, and then downloading and installing the software um, and getting it running. And, you know, most of that's Linux based. And, and so you do that and, and you, can, um, you can get that up and running. You download the blockchain and then you start, um, you start mining. And, and then your, your block reward is, is essentially a, what you would expect is it's in relation to your overall contribution to the network, right? So if you have 1% of the hash power <laughs> in the network, you would expect to get 1% of the rewards from the network. Um, and that's a lot of work and, and absolutely, I mean, I loved doing it. It was a fascinating project. It was difficult, but it was, it was, it was great. And, um, I mined for a couple of months and then I wasn't making any money anymore. So it was like, okay, I had to shut them down because they, you got to pay power and everything on those. But, um, it was more of a science experiment for me than anything. And, and I did mine on the Ethereum blockchain. I, I haven't, I haven't actually mined on the Bitcoin blockchain, but I, I did mining on the Ethereum one. Um, so that's kind of one way. Uh, the other way is to join a mining pool. Um, and you can look at those out there. I, I don't have, I've not mined with a pool. I don't have any recommendations on which pool to use, but uh, there are pool reputations out there and things like that. And this would be that you have like a computer that usually has a graphics card in it. Um, and you would join a pool and you would just essentially loan out your graphics cards, potential um, hash power to the pool of miners, the mining pool, like rocket pool or something like that. I, I, I think that's one of the names I'm, I'm actually, I, I don't quote me on that one, but um, and so what they do then is they aggregate all of the, all the people around the world that are mining as part of their pool. And then they get block rewards and then they distribute the block rewards out to all their constituents in relation to their contributions, minus a fee, of course, right? So that's one way that you can get set up. And that's like, if you have a graphics card and you're not doing anything with it, you know, you wouldn't want to do this while you're playing because it'll, it'll run your graphics card 100%. It will cost you electricity and things like that. But you can do that by essentially downloading, you know, finding a pool, downloading some software. Um, but I would just encourage you if you're doing that to um, look online, uh, maybe check Reddit. Reddit tends to be a pretty good resource to determine whether or not something's a scam. Um, and and um, it does involve you downloading and installing software, right, which could have viruses on it. It could, it could be malware. So you want to be careful there. Um, most of them are legit, but certainly not all. Um, and that, so that's one way of doing it. That's kind of what we call pool mining. So there's solo mining, which is build it all yourself, do it all yourself, then pool mining. Um, now there is another option out there called cloud mining, which is essentially you just pay a, 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 a company to mine for you. Um, and I don't know that there's any way that you could 
say that that's going to be economically viable or, or economically better than just buying Ethereum or buying Bitcoin, right? Because you got to look at like, if you're paying them to mine for you, they're taking a cut. Are you ever going to get enough back versus wouldn't you just buy it, buy it outright? You know, because you're, what you're mining for is you're mining to get rewards. And you know, if you're mining Ethereum, you're trying to get rewards in Ethereum. So you could just go out and buy Ethereum instead of cloud mining. So I would say if you want to play around with it, go after maybe some solo mining at first, or, I'm sorry, go after some um, uh, pool mining at first, try to, you know, explore that a little bit. Um, it's certainly a fun little science project. There's no question. If you really want to get crazy, you can go solo mining. Um, although I would absolutely look for some of the smaller uh, coins to do that on because like you're, you would need, I mean, you're talking, if you wanted to, if you wanted to mine Bitcoin today, you're probably looking at somewhere north of $20 million to get started. Um, it's a significant investment in the amount of hardware that you would need in order to set up a mining rig or my, a mining enough mining rigs to have a significant impact. So a uh, very, very big upfront cost there. But if you're working on those smaller coins, um, then there's not nearly as much competition and you can start get started with much smaller uh, units and things like that. So that would well, be I noticed, how you could become a miner. I'm sorry, Dave, I, I noticed that some no, of the, uh, I looked at uh, some, um, I guess they're called uh, crypto mining rigs uh mm -hmm. used yeah. ones for sale on uh ebay and um yeah they're all uh you know 20 grand and up so it, oh, it yeah, is yeah. a significant yeah, no, investment sure. to get started yeah, yeah. um yeah. okay well thank you for that um uh, nicole has sure. another question and uh yeah i just uh, probably need to reiterate that dave is not a tax lawyer but um the question is where is the safety net in a solo 401k for example yeah. Sure. So I, I don't think that there is one. Um, I would say that if you if you wanted to go down the path of doing a, either an IRA, a, like a self-directed IRA or a solo 401k and investing that in crypto, um, you do it does come with it the risk of loss of, of um, uh, anything up into in, including all of your all of your invested principal. So um, it definitely is um, it carries just as much risk as any as any other investment in crypto. Um, however, if you are um, you know such as I am, like confident in, in the long-term prospects of it, and um, you know, willing to be patient with it, uh, you can have significant tax benefits to that. Um, particularly, I, I'm I am a fan of Roth um, Roth IRA, Roth 401k. Uh, in which case, you pay the taxes up front, and you don't pay any any taxes on your gains. Um, so something like that. If you look at you know potential upside in crypto, um, you could you know see significant upside without without any taxation. Um, on the other hand. Right. There's only so much you can put into an IRA every year. Um, if that gets wiped out, it gets wiped out. And so I think it's something that should be taken up, uh, you know, carefully considered and, and uh, something you should make sure is right for you if you want to want to go down that road. But uh, but there are options for it. And it's um, it's something that a lot of folks are doing. Um, and like I said, I, I, I do have a firm I've worked with personally, have very good experience with them um, and their you know, fees are reasonable and everything like that. So. But, yeah, I would say there is no there is no safety. <laughs> Just like you, you could lose, you know, you could lose uh, if you made a poor investment in the stock or something like that, or or um, anything like that within a more traditional four hundred one k. Okay, um, I want to thank Nicole for the questions. Uh, here's her uh, last cool. question: Are there any psychological theories on how people buy, sell, or speculate? Sure. I don't know if there are formal ones, but I can tell you. Um, I can tell you how it usually works. Right, is that um, people wait? <laughs> people wait until the mania phase to buy, and then they wait until the depths of despair to sell, and they lose money. Um, that's how things tend to work. Um, there is a—I I could probably bring it up here. There is a, a chart which gets a lot of flack, but um, I mean, there is a lot to be said for it. It's this, uh, the the, um, the the anatomy of a bubble. Um, uh, hang on here. And so this is a chart that, that I, I don't even know who, who did it first, but um, let me pull one up here and drag it to the screen. So um, I don't know what site this is, just bear with me. Um, but essentially, so you've got these, this is, this is what they say is kind of a classic mania or classic bubble, right? So you have the stealth phase where things the smart money is getting in and you've got this awareness phase where the institutional investors are you know, bear trap here where it's where certain sell off and people panic out, you know, that kind of thing. But then it really takes off. Right. 
and you get up to the top and it's a new paradigm and everything's going to be great and it's never going to go down right um and then it drops and then it goes back up a little bit everybody thinks oh phew we're going back and then it really drops out right um and so what you tend to see is people buying here right and then people selling here and um so that's that's really where the, the patience uh patience comes in um i mean if we look at um uh, let's see here so i get the right screen if we look at the um we look at the history of Bitcoin here. So let me just zoom way out here. This is just a trading view chart. Um, I mean, if we look at this, we saw, we kind of see this value, like this is our 2017 run. So we had our run up here, right? You know, it kind of looks the same, right? It runs up, it goes up, it drops, bounces back a little bit, and then it starts to come back down again. Now this is of course in logarithmic view. So let me show you the real one, right? So this is, this is, it goes up, right? drops like a rock it does bounce here just a little bit um then it, then it you know so this is as you bounce back up and it, it runs back down like this I, I wrote this one up and, and wrote it down um so there's a lot of uh you know the joke is you, you you know you're supposed to buy low and sell high but what you end up doing is buying high and sell low um so patience is key i i would say that it also helps to zoom out right i mean you look at this and then you zoom out and you look okay well even if you had bought at the top here in 2017 and wrote it all the way down and wrote it up and then wrote it down here you'd still be up 50 percent on your money from buying at the top here right you'd be from 20,000 up to 33,000 right now even if you had bought at the top and then missed selling this and and nobody knows what's gonna happen next right this this could be right right here up and back down we could bounce and then really drop again or we could be in a place where we're gonna you know we're gonna move back up it's, it's very difficult to tell um so uh but i would say you know market psychology tends to follow human psychology um i would say that generally speaking crypto tends to be pretty well understood through fun, uh, through technical analysis which is drawing lines on charts and things like that um because in my opinion the reason it is is because it's a relatively immature market and it's almost all controlled through algorithmic trading with bots and the bots are programmed by humans and the humans look at lines on charts and so i think that that tends to be my my opinion on why things follow um pretty classical uh technical indicators on the uh, on charts i don't know if i quite answered that but i, I hope I, I hope i did um did somewhat well dave i want to thank you for uh this yeoman's work on this really this was fantastic um and for for us and for our patrons, what a tremendous value. And and uh, thanks again, too, for uh, posting some of the resources for people to dig a little bit further. Um, I just want to remind our guests that you can, if, if you didn't write down what those resources are, you can uh, go back to uh, view the video of this session, which will, again, be posted to uh, Livonia Public Library's YouTube channel, and you can see what the resources are there. And you can also, like I said, you can come and visit me, Ken Bignati, at the Livonia Public Library, and I'll help you dig further into this um, fascinating subject. So uh, again, thanks to all of our uh, participants for coming in today. I hope you enjoyed this. I certainly did. Uh, Dave, I will be uh, in touch with you, uh, probably sending you a um, email tomorrow. Uh, right, but until then, thank you very much. And everybody else, uh, thank you for attending. And everybody have a great evening. Bye-bye now. All right. Thank you very much. Bye now.